All right, uh, if you could begin to take your seats, we're going to start a slideshow that I'm sure most of you are going to want to see. So if I could have your attention, everyone, we're going to start a slideshow. And so if you could begin to take your seats, uh, we'll get started in just a couple minutes.
right, if you'd find your seats, we're going to get started. So uh, please come on down and find your seats, and we'll turn the lights on up here and get started in just a minute. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Just want to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to this celebration of life for Walter Bucher. I know the family really appreciates everybody being here uh, to enjoy this time of celebration, and that's what it is. Hey, so I want to start off with uh, some scripture. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. God's Word says this, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and the mortal put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Walter Bucher's labor was not in vain because it was in the Lord. Walter has been changed from the, mor from the mortal to the immortal with Jesus in heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. Walter Bucher, most of you know some of these things I'm going to share with you, but Walter was born on May 30th. I always remembered his birthday because it was my wife's birthday. Couldn't forget that. Uh, but 1931, and passed into glory on December 9th, 2023, 91 years old, a good, a good long life. Walter was one of the founding members here at North Shore Alliance Church. He held many offices, probably every office you could hold, elder, governing board member, treasurer, deacon, helper with everything and more. We honored uh, Walter and uh, Lois Strasbaugh a few years ago for all of their wonderful, wonderful service through the years uh, here, almost 40 years, roughly, uh, since the beginning of, of North Shore. And all Walter would say was, my wife did everything. I never got to meet his wife. I've been here 11 years, but uh, I missed that pleasure and privilege of meeting Rosie but uh, he did a few things. His wife didn't do everything. He did probably just about everything that could be done. I wanted to read a portion of his obituary that was just wonderful to you. Uh, some really incredible things and interesting things. Born in Hocking County near Rockbridge, Ohio, to parents Jesse and Leela. He was the youngest of 10 children. That just stops me in my tracks right there. When he was three, moved to Lancaster, Ohio, where he grew up. At 21, he married the love of his life, Rosie. They purchased the farm from his parents, raised their family there. Walter and Rosie moved to North Fort Myers in 1966. I bet they saw some changes 
from 1966 all the way to now. They had four children, Randall, Vicki, Keith, and Cheryl. And once in Florida, as most of you know, Walter enjoyed snook fishing. Tell you more about that in a little bit. We all probably have a story about Walter and fishing. Uh, playing cards with family and friends, he ventured into working at Babcock Farms for a while and bought several laundromats in the area. Walter and Rosie spent many summers also at their cottage at the Lancaster Campground and enjoyed pickleball before it was trendy. Enjoyed Ohio State football games. That's it. Uh, I can't say anything. My wife's from Ohio. I can't say a word. Um, enjoyed a lot of things. Those Ohio State football games, hunting and eating mushrooms. Loved his mushrooms. Many mushroom stories. Uh, Walter and Rosie were married for nearly 60 years. Praise the Lord. They were the embodiment of the love of Christ through their relationship. And that was probably the most important thing that I, that I read in his obituary. They embodied the love of Christ through their relationship. Amen to that. Walter was preceded in death by both parents, his wife, uh, all nine of his siblings, his son Randy as well. His legacy lives on through his daughters, Vicki, Cheryl, and son Keith, along with nine grandchildren and 16 great-grandchildren. I just want to tell you a few uh, remembrances that I have uh, of Walter. I remember visiting him uh, in his place, in his condo, when I first arrived about 11 years ago, and Walter asked me all about me. And if you get to know people, everybody enjoys talking about themselves. Not a lot of people really will ask you about you, will they? There, may I say there's not enough people that will, ask, that will genuinely ask you about you. How are you? What, what do you like? What do you do? What are, what are you interested in? But I went there to encourage him and to, to meet him and get to know him, and he just encouraged me and blessed me. Um, my wife and my three kids, we moved here from Port St. Lucie, uh, and we got called by the Lord here around Thanksgiving, but my wife was teaching, her kids were in school, you know, didn't, couldn't pull out of that until the end of the school year. So my wife and three kids stayed in Port St. Lucie, and, and I came here, so I was here like four days, and then went to Port St. Lucie for three days, and did that for about seven months, and I remember visiting Walter probably about three or four months into that, and you know, he asked me, how are you really doing? And I was like, man, I miss my family. I miss my wife. And, you know, I've never done this before. And uh, he said, I remember plain as day, he said, you know, my, my wife passed away a few years ago. I miss her every single day. It just, it doesn't go away. And he said, I'll bet I know when you miss her the most. I was like, okay. He said, when you go to bed. I said, yeah, I mean, I don't even want to go to bed because you're just used to, you know, at that time, about 25 years of us into marriage and you're just always with your wife when you go to bed together. And uh, I said, yeah, that's really the hardest time for me. I don't even want to go to bed because it's just so hard. And he's spent time encouraging me who just met him. And I, I'll never forget that because I really was like, Lord, help me encourage this guy and I came away very, very encouraged, and I remember that to this day. One of the other fond memories I have with Walter was talking about his snook fishing. He pulled out a photo album, and I, I thought to myself, oh, this is cool. He's going to show me pictures of his family. <laughs> every photo was fish, every single photo. I was like, you're my hero, man. This is, like, so cool. Every photo was fish. And now I know why we have all the fishing regulations that we have. Because he caught the snook. My favorite picture, and it was in the slideshow, was one Vicky was in that caught, Vicky caught this monster snook that was almost as big as she was. And I said two things. I said, wow, what a fish. And I said, who's that beside the fish? She's like, that's Vicky. I went, no. She said, yeah, that's Vicky. So we were all we were all young once, <laughs> but, 
But man, he loved fishing, and I was new here looking for some snook spots, and he hooked me up and told me about several spots to go fishing. And man, he loved his fishing. The last memory I want to share, uh, and then we're going to have a time for the family to share some memories as well and remembrances. And actually, I'm going to share one more memory, special memory at the end in our closing. But um, the last memory right now I want to share was just a few weeks before he passed away. He was at his new place, and he showed me all around. And man, he seemed great uh, just a few weeks before he passed away. And uh, he was very proud of, of the new place and the, the water fountain and, and the whole place and the place you could go outside and uh, took me in his room and had his little kitchenette, had his pictures up, the few pictures that made it from the storm. He had made a, or somebody had made a, a like a family thing on uh, that he could have there with him. But the thing that I noticed the most was his Bible uh, right, right by his chair. He had one chair. And, you know, a little TV and some other things. But he had his Bible right by his chair and uh, talked to me about reading God's Word. And every single morning, Walter was in the Word every single morning. Then I uh, sat with Tony and Vicki and some other family members, and they shared with me how he read the Bible through so many times. Couldn't remember how many times, 15, 16, 17, and more that he had written in one Bible, and that was just over one span and God's word was important to Walter, and then one of, one of the family members shared that if you walked in on him while he was reading God's word in the morning, uh, you would have to wait, because that was his time with the Lord. And man, that shows me all I need to know about Walter Booker. He loved God, and he loved people, and he will surely, surely be missed. Uh, right now, we're going to have a time of sharing from the family, and Tony's going to start that off. All right, well, thank you um, from our family for coming. For the better part of the past week, I've been trying to figure out what to say. Each time I thought about it, I ended up like this with tears and just putting it off. So I thought about sharing, starting by sharing a few funny stories to lighten the mood, like a memory of when my grandpa, when we were kids, ran across the tennis court to whoop my younger brother because he threw the tennis racket on the ground. Um, or another memory when we were driving back from Ohio and he proceeded to slam on the brakes and spill an entire thing of applesauce on me in the back seat. Um, but even with those funny memories, uh, come to my mind, I well up with emotion, so I'll just apologize if it takes me a moment as I'm going through this to compose myself. As I was talking with people over the last few weeks about my grandpa, I came to the realization that my grandpa to me was actually two different people in my life. Throughout my childhood, grandpa was this beacon in my life for me. And for many in our family, you call him the patriarch of our family, but he was like this unshakable example of consistency, faith, and righteousness. He was a rock in an otherwise very shaky childhood environment. I always knew where I would find him. Many times it was simply in his re recliner at the condo, either reading or, or watching some kind of sports on TV. But I really saw him as the first true example of what a man of God should look like. He never missed church. He prayed often, read his Bible every single day. And he was a critical part in building up and growing the church that we all grew up in. This one. The thing is, though, he was on such a lofty pedestal that he almost seemed distant. Like a hero that you knew, but you didn't ever think you could get too close to, and you certainly didn't feel like you could measure up to. That was most apparent to me about 15 years ago when I was a young adult here at North Shore. Our pastor at the time came up to me and asked if I would consider being a part of the governing board. My immediate response and answer to him was no way. See, to me, people on the governing board 
were men like Bob Strasball, Lee Straley. And my grandpa. I remember thinking, I in no way measured up to those standards. Eventually I accepted it and I still didn't feel right being in the same role that my grandpa once was in the church. Those men were giants to me. Then something changed in our relationship as I got older. It wasn't overnight, but more gradual, as I got to see more sides of Grandpa Booker. Driving he and my grandma back and forth to Ohio for several years showed me a, a tender and loving side of him that I didn't know as a young boy. How he would wait when he got out of the car to hold my grandma's hand when, when we were walking into a restaurant. And how even after she passed, he'd still keep a picture of her right by his bed for many years after, just so he could say goodnight, Rosie. He knew the names of his neighbors. He wouldn't just rush by without a, at least a greeting or a small conversation. He truly cared about people and relationships. I also got to see more of his fun side, whether it was at an Ohio State football game or watching him play with one of our kids. So many amazing memories flood my mind of time spent with Grandpa over this past 10 plus years as an adult. Hours in the car, arguing with him over his terrible choices of music or how fast I was driving. I didn't let him drive again after he spilled the applesauce, just, just to be clear. Time spent with him watching more sports. He was always amazed by how much information my little phone had in it. I could just, any question he asked about something we were watching, I'd plug it in. Say, this is the answer, and it just, it floored him. I, I got, we got to learn that his favorite color was purple. That's why many of us are wearing it today. You can see it in the pictures. He told me once that it, it had to do with his high school, his high school colors or something like that. I learned that he liked to buy and collect things, especially after my grandma had passed. I think, I don't know if it was because he was bored or he was just always seeing things, but he started to buy stuff off of TV. He had this pretty extensive coin collection for a little while. Uh, but each time I went up there and I was in the cottage, undoubtedly he'd bring me some little trinket, a watch or uh, something else that the company had sent with whatever he bought, something he got for free. He's like, here, you want this? I'm like, no, I don't need a watch. I'm good. But many other times he would call to help him fix his TV or his remote control. I became his IT guy of sorts, although I don't think he would know what IT stands for. <laughs> To him, it just meant usually I could help him with his TV or his, or his phone. All that time, though, sitting there pushing a few buttons on his remote to correct the input or setting up the speed dial on his phone or rewriting the numbers of his favorite TV channels on his little piece of paper that he kept by his favorite chair. I think back now and part of me believes it was Grandpa's way. Of just getting me to come by. I've got dozens of voicemails from him saying, Tony, give me a ring. And then one that makes me smile when, it, when I listen to it, he says, Tony, come by and fix my TV and I'll give you your Christmas money. <laughs> the grandpa in my, that in my childhood seemed so otherworldly was just a normal guy with a normal life that needed some help from time to time and really enjoyed being around his family. The legacy that my grandpa leaves me isn't in money or material things, it's in the lessons that I learned throughout all these memories. You can live a righteous life without being perfect. You can be strong and firm while still being loving, tender, and compassionate. You can speak into and impact the lives of so many people without saying all that much at all. I am so thankful for all the time that we had with him, and as much as I want so much more time, I know he's happier now. If you asked my grandpa how he was over the past 12 years, he more than likely would have responded to you with about half. He had a missing piece since my grandma passed. I rejoice knowing now that grandpa is whole again, living in glory with grandma and all of our other loved ones and our heavenly father. Thank you. All right, I think we're gonna have Lainey come up.
Hi, I'm Lainey, and I'm one of Walter's great-grandkids. Most of you probably don't know this, but my mom is a nerd, and she loves puzzles. She doesn't do them very much because she can't focus on anything else until it's finished, so she has started working on them around the holidays. The last several years, it's been a family tradition, and parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and even great-grandpas all participate. A few years ago, while in North Carolina for Thanksgiving, we worked on a puzzle for several days. It was a brand new puzzle and we were so This is one of those mom moments where I do not love this at all, but you just pull it together for your kid. <laughs> so I'll do my best. I know she was kind of going fast, so I think if that's okay, I'm just going to start over. All right, so this is Lainey. She's one of Walter's great-grandkids. Most of you probably don't know this, but my mom, me, is a nerd, and I do love puzzles. <laughs> I don't do them very much because I get obsessed, and I can't focus on anything until it's completely finished. So I started working on them around the holidays. The last several years, it's been a family tradition where parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and even great-grandpas all participate. A few years ago, while in North Carolina for Thanksgiving, we worked on a puzzle for several days. It was a brand new puzzle, and we were sure all the pieces were there. Grandpa Booker watched us as he rested on the couch, watching his sports as he always did. After we did all the hard work, Finally getting to those last few pieces, we couldn't find the last piece. For at least 10 minutes, which felt like an hour, we looked all over and under everything. We couldn't find the missing piece. I guess when Grandpa Booker thought we'd had enough, he slowly stood up, walked towards the puzzle, and pulled the last piece out of his pocket. <laughs> and he said, I always put the last puzzle piece in, and so he did. <laughs> After talking with, uh, you know, telling this story to a few of the other uh, family members, um, you know, Vicki, Keith, Lori, he apparently has always done this. He too loved puzzles and always saved the last piece for himself, which, of course, the great grandkids especially and the grandkids did not know that. So that was a real big surprise to us when he pulled that piece out of his pocket. And she has a picture here of this day, the very moment. You can see Grandpa pointing to that last piece with his funny guy smile. And um, we're glad that we're able to have that laugh in this picture. I think everyone there really remembers that day and that moment. Um, she said she's going to put this picture back on the table for anyone to look at it if they want. So, and then um, if there's any other family that would like to come up, I think this is the opportunity to do so. Good job. Hi, my name is Kaylee, and I want, I want to talk about my great-grandpa. I have so many memories with Grandpa, especially these are my favorite. One of my favorite moments was when I used to play with his toy dogs on the table every single day when we went there. I also used to try to read his newspaper when he read it when he used to read it. I also used to watch people play tennis in his old apartment. I don't know if I'm the one to come up here and do this. When I came into his house, on the door he had a guitar and it made noise like someone is playing the guitar. When I went over there, I used to look at the pictures, see the elves, look at, look at the bass fish on the wall. 
when we went over there, I always used to ask him, Grandpa, why do you have so many puzzle pieces on the table? He said, because it's a thousand piece puzzle and I'm trying to finish it. I always used to sit by the big grandfather clock he had and try to, and try to tell the time. I remember that at his old house, is that the other condo? The other condo, I always used to help him up the stairs and hold his hand. That is my favorite memories about my grandpa. I just have one thing to say. I've said it publicly before, and I'll say it again. I am so forever grateful for Christian parents. I can't thank them enough for the life they gave me and the life they shared, showed me and what they shared with all of my, our family. Forever grateful. guys know me. If you don't know me, my name's Andy Boone. Um, Grandpa. <laughs> Obviously, we're all here for a reason. Family. That's exactly what Grandpa was. That's all he was. He was the, he was the head of the family. I mean, when you talk about love, it was Grandpa. Well, for the last year and a half, I was so blessed, so blessed. Just being able to be with him more and more and more and more. Um, the fact that every Sunday I got to bring him here whenever I could, wasn't working or had anything special going on. Those are the days that I would wake up early. All right, man. Let's go get grandpa, go to church, go get something to eat, have a good day. You know, that's how the days start. Watch half a game with him. Next thing you know, he's falling asleep in his chair. Hey, grandpa, I'm out of here, man. I'll see you later. He would always ask me, you ain't got, he would always say, you ain't got to go so early. No, but I'll be back next week. Well, the unfortunate thing is that we don't get to see him anymore. But the one thing that I get to do is love him every day. Because he loved every single one of us. Every single one of us. And if you didn't feel it, you weren't looking for it. Because he gave it. He gave it more than anybody I knew except for Grandma. She was an entity in her own. The one thing that I always get every single time when I came to see him did you see that Buckeye game? mic time uh, in just a few minutes. I'll let you know when that is for anybody to share a memory. Right now, Aubrey Booker, great-granddaughter, is going to sing a song. Hi, um, I'm Aubrey, and Walter is my great-grandpa. I know he loved Jesus and him, so this hymn is dedicated to him.
Just as I am without one plea But that thy blood was shed for me And that thou bidst me come to thee O Lamb of God, I come I come Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood To thee whose blood can cleanse its spot O Lamb of God I come I come Just as I am though tossed about With many a conflict, many a doubt to fighting and fears within, without, O oh, Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, poor wretched, blind, sight riches, healing of the mind, yeah, all I need in thee to find, O oh, Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, glance, relief, because thy promise I believe, O oh, Lamb of God, I come, I come. O oh, Lamb of God, I come, I come. Amen. Hey, so we're going to have a time of uh, open mic for anybody to come up and share uh, a, mem a remembrance, a memory. So uh, please come on up. Good morning. I'm Paul Peterson. I go to this church, and I've uh, got to know Walter quite a bit. Uh, when he, Sunday morning, he would come over here, and he'd just sit down a lot of times by himself. And so I'd just wander over and sit down by him. And you know Walter. He didn't talk a lot, but if you sat there a while, he'd start opening up a little bit. And a couple of the times he would tell a few stories. Um, I heard a lot about the... Uh, Snook stories, but you haven't heard about the walleye stories yet, I don't think. He uh, would go up north, and he loved to fish up north in those cold lakes, and he loved to catch his walleye. And he would tell me stories about that, and, you know, after a while I started thinking, you know, if he really caught all those fish that he says he did, I I'm wondering how in the world that boat ever made it back to the shore. It was so full. But he was a character, and I really enjoyed sitting there talking with him. And one other thing that he would end up talking about, and we've mentioned it a few times already, and that was his lovely wife, Rosie. And he never forgot her, never. And he would say, yes, Rosie left me, but he's, she's in heaven, and I know one day I'm going to be with her. And I can just see him right now up there in heaven with Rosie, holding her hand, walking down the streets of gold and just singing and praising his God. We love Walter and we're going to miss him, but he's in a great place right now. You guys could have, uh, you know, moved back a bit and left some room for the old lady up in the front, but... Um, I'm, I'm June Holiday, and I came to North Shore Church in 1984. 
and Walter and Rosie and, well, you know, you guys don't know, but I know. And, of course, I can't remember anybody's names because I'm the crazy old lady. But it was, it was such a joy to know Walter and Rosie. Rosie was the kind that came running up and grabbed you and said, come on, let's go do this and here. I can help you do that. And when I had my son, she was in the nursery. She was, Walter was like grandpa. Walter just was grandpa. If the boys came around, come on boys. And they just calm right down. And, and, you know, I didn't have that kind of ability to do magic with him, but he did. I, I saw a picture recently of North Shore Church when it was at Price Cutter, when they were putting the signs up. And there was Walter and I think Bob Strasbaugh putting the signs up on the building that said North Shore Alliance Church. And that was even before I was there. And, you know, that's like when the earth cooled. It was a long time ago. But I just think that was Walter. Walter wasn't the guy that stood up on the front and said, Oh, here I am. I'm Walter Boothker, and I'm going to do this and everything. Walter was the guy that saw something needed to be done, and he did it. And, he, and you never even knew how it got done. It just got done because Walter was there, and he took care of it. And Rosie... All of them, you know the guys. But anyway, he'll be missed. And, and I, I always look over there, and there's Walter sitting. And he'll still be sitting there. Just now he's got Rosie sitting with him. because my mom, June, it's really hard. I did not think I'd come here and cry um, because I've lost my dad. And um, my mom, June, and my dad, Al, were really best friends with Walter and Rosie <laughs> and I'm the fourth child their fourth child and um, they moved down here in 1960 or 59 60 and I was born in 62 and I think Walter and Rosie were some of the first people I really got to know outside of my own parents because we were at their house all the time <laughs> And it was after church, and I kind of started thinking back there as I was listening to the stories that you guys are hugely instrumental in my life because my parents started going to the Alliance Church. I don't know, maybe because of Walter and Rosie and the Straley's and the Petersons and a lot of people that went from the Methodist Church to the Alliance Church. And it was at that Alliance Church that I met most of my childhood friends and went to camp from that Alliance Church and met my husband. And now I have an entirely different life. The trajectory of my life changed because of the Alliance Church. And when you mentioned that Walter's favorite color was purple, it came back and hit me. They had a purple house. And I told my husband, I said, I said, their house was purple. And he looked at me and he went, what? And I, they really had a beautiful purple house. And that's just is such a memory to me. One of the memories I have of being there is we were there on a Sunday afternoon. I think I was in my dress, dress shoes, and probably not much different than I am now. And we walked outside. And we were all looking around at the water, and people had been out of the boat. But I was dressed up, and I couldn't go on the boat. But I was standing by the seawall, on the seawall, and I was looking down. And I saw a big crab 
And I was so excited. So I started hollering for people to come outside and look at this crab. And I showed them the crab. And as soon as I showed them the crab, I fell in. And so I was in my dress clothes and shoes. And I don't even remember how I got out, but I think it was Keith or Walter or somebody had to go along and jump down on the bottom part by the boat and grab my hand and pull me out of the water. But I will never forget that story. And I'll never forget my parents just hanging out at their house and playing Rook. I mean, Rook was a big thing. Cards, cards. I just, wa I just watched them having fun just doing normal, fun, family activities together. And you don't see that very often anymore. But my family, my kids, love to play cards. And I don't know if that came from, you know, me watching it. And I don't like puzzles, so I wasn't around for the puzzles, but they're too time-consuming for me. Um, and I like to win, so it's hard to win in a puzzle. Maybe that's how Walter won, by keeping that last piece. But my dad certainly liked to win. So competitive games with him, um, were all, they, he was all about it. Dominoes, cards, rook, I mean, fishing, everything. But I can't thank you guys, the Bookers, enough just for just being part of our family and just giving us so many wonderful memories. And still to this day, just staying in touch, even though we don't see each other a lot. It's like we're, we're close friends, and we always will be. And I thank them also for their great faith and staying strong and being examples to your family and to ours as well. So thank you. My name is AJ Booker. I'm sure much more of you guys know, more, know me than I know you. Um, and I don't like public speaking, but I'm going to give it a shot. I have three phases of my life that I remember, Grandpa. Um, the first one is mostly of my grandma, actually, because Grandpa spent a lot of time in that chair when I was like four or five, and Andrea and I would go over and um, just lay on their kitchen floor. She would have some snacks ready for us, and we would do the little wood puzzles. They only had like five pieces, but we were so young that they were still challenging. And I didn't see much of Grandpa then, and I was kind of just, I don't know, anytime he would come over, it was just kind of like, it was strange. It was like, you were almost scared of him just because I didn't see him much. And when we would go and just watch TV in the room and everything, and it was mainly just Grandma Rosie um, but as I got older, um, I had the opportunity to go with my dad and drive my grandpa down from Ohio. This was after Grandma Rosie passed. And he didn't tell you that I was there, but when the applesauce fell on him, it was actually because I was in the passenger seat and I had to use the restroom. And I told Grandpa, hey, pull over here so I can go to the bathroom in the bush. And he slammed on his brakes and the applesauce fell out of this, this porcelain container and just all over him. And <laughs> it, was, it was really funny. But... That, that is the portion of my life that I really got to know Grandpa, and we had all those funny and just close memories. He wasn't just that guy that was sitting in the chair when we would go over to their house, and Grandma Rosie was always in the kitchen just playing with us, and, but he was just this fun, loving guy. And then we fast forward to this point in my life, and a couple months ago um, when Irma hit, for Myers, my parents and grandpa all came up to mine and my wife's house. Yeah, Ian, sorry, <laughs> two hurricanes, it was crazy. Um, but they, we had the opportunity to just spend time with them and we went to breakfast and stuff and it was just, I really valued that, um, that time we were able to have with him just a couple months before he left us. And um, it just really just changed my perspective of him as a person from those three different points in my life, it just sums up our relationship, how, how much it's grown as I've grown. And what I've always known is just grandpa, he's, he's there. And he'll always, when you go up to him, I mean, if you're family, I don't know if you're not, but if to everyone, pretty much he's family. He'll give you a hug, he'll kiss you on the cheek. 
and I always hated it when I was little because, <laughs> but um, I just really love those moments with him. And um, for one reason or another, I've always loved being a booker, but it's really just because of the family that you get when you're part of this family. Um, just extends generations through my grandpa, through my dad and my parents and just everybody. But just wanted to share that. You did a good job, AJ. Um, I'm just going to touch on that, what you said about being a booker. Uh, I just want to say I've been around since 1998, and I came from basically no family at all. And I just think it's such an honor to have been brought into this family and to learn everything that I've learned and to know that it really started with Rosie and Walter. I mean, from this building, this church, Awanas, the great grandkids, my daughter being baptized right behind me. Um, there's not a lot of families out there like this that exist that have the stories and the history and the generation um, and all of so many living s together in the same, you know, small radius. And it's just, it's just been a real honor. And I just, I know a lot of us are thinking it's an end of an era um, with Rosie and Walter, but when I look out and I see all of these bookers, it's almost like it's just beginning because these great grandkids that are this big are here today. They're up here singing and, and speaking and um, just showing the love that they have from where it all started with Walter and, and Rosie. So I just wanted to say um, that it is quite the honor to have been brought into this family um, and be here today and to celebrate Walter. <laughs> Shocked. <laughs> I didn't know Walter. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know him at all. And my uh, knowledge of him came from Vicki, and I did see the influence that he had on her, the just unabashed love um, that he gave her, she returned to him in how she treated him and how she loved him, especially in her later years. Like I said, I didn't know Walter, and I would hazard to guess there's probably a few other people in here who didn't know him at all either. but. You should always associate a couple of words or something about someone having to do with what little tiny bit of knowledge you do have about that person. <clears throat> and Vicki, my knowledge of your father is two words. And I don't know if they're right or wrong or if they're even the correct memories, but they're my memories. And that's wedge salad and French onion soup. <laughs> because of Applebee's. I used to go to Applebee's to watch my football games, which were not uh, on locally, and Vicki would say, why don't, we're going there with Dad, we're taking Dad there, and whatever, and whether or not we ever shared a meal that included those two things, those are the two things. So my, my tale to you would be, try and learn maybe two words that can associate someone's memory in your memory forever. Take it. Hi, many of you don't know me, but I'm Brenda Richards. Um, I used to live out on Volcalia. And so, oops, sorry. <laughs> um, many of you don't know me. I'm Brenda Richards. I live in Avon Park. But Vicki and I um, and a lot of the cheerleaders that are here cheered together. And so I lived out on Boquilla. And so when we would have cheerleading practice or games, 
it was quite a ways to come in for my parents. And so the Bookers would let me come over to their house. And, you know, they always treated me just like I was part of the family. And, of course, Vicki and I liked to primp. We had big hairdos, lots of hairspray, and Mrs. Booker was always good about letting us primp, and Mr. Booker was always somewhere on the sidelines at the games, especially when Randy played and Steve Lozo, Neil's brother, and uh, we had a lot of good memories, and they were very good to me. And one of my special memories of Mrs. Booker was her black walnut cookies. And if you'd never had them, I'm telling you, you missed a treat. They were, and the special ingredients was love. Because I bought some black walnuts the other day at Publix, and my cookies didn't taste like your mom's. <laughs> Hi, I'm June Tapio, <clears throat> and my daughter came up to try to express our closeness growing up and being with the Bookers, and I certainly need to also express my appreciation for having known them and been with them so much. We did so many things together. And I'll miss, I miss them. And when you're talking about words in remembrance of someone, I know that Rosie and Walter are two words that go together. You can't have one without the other. And I just, just love my memories, and the family, and everything that they've meant to all of us. And thank you for all of these kind thoughts that you've shared with us. I love it. Thank you. I also have a fear of public speaking, so bear with me. Um, so, um, a lot of people may not know who I am. They probably know me by Billy Booker. My name is actually Walter Booker, um, but Billy has been my nickname since I was a kid. Um, growing up with the name of your grandfather was always a little scary because you wanted to represent the name, and I think that um, I have tried to do that throughout my life, and I hope that I continue to do that. Um, I will miss him, even though the, we did not have the closeness that he had with other family members. I will always try to represent his name going forward. I also, obviously, I didn't get the memo either about the purple, because I, I mean, I kind of feel like a Kaiser Soze moment for those that know the, the movie Usual Suspects. It's all coming together now, so. Um, but uh, anyways, um, you know, I know we're gonna wrap it up here. I just wanted to say that, you know, even though he is gone, he is still with us in our heart. And I am honored to have named my son after him um, to keep the tradition alive. So 
Uh, thank you. I met Walter when he first moved down here from Ohio. He came to the school, and I showed his son Randy where all his classes were, and we were friends ever ever since. He lived over there before he passed right when he was my mom. So we stayed friends for a long time. And I just want to tell you two quick stories. One time me and Randy took off in his VW, and who knows what we were doing, but we were having some fun. We didn't get far away, and there was this big five-foot rattlesnake on the road. So I told Randy, I said, just run over it. So he ran over it, and all that did was aggravate it a little bit. So I got outside the car, and I said, Randy, what you got to do is when you run over, you got to slam the brakes on and skid over it. So that made it a little bit madder. So back then, you know, I'm a native around here, and you see a rattlesnake. If it's near your house, like near where Mr. Booker lived, you're going to kill it, you know. So I went in the back trunk, and I got his big toolbox out, Walters. And I took that, and I crushed it with the toolbox. But I bit, bent it a little bit. So when we got back, I said, uh, Mr. Booker, um, i got to tell you something. I, I bent your toolbox. And he's like, well, how'd you do that? So I explained the story, how I did it. And then he said something like, you know, he's so calm and reserved. He's always like, the whole time I ever knew him and me and Randy doing all kinds of crazy stuff, he never even said anything about, you sure you want to do that? You know, that's about it. So anyway... I explained it to him, and he said, it's okay. Then one other time, me and Randy decided to go hunting. We come back with a 250-pound hog. So we bring it back to Walter, and we go, look, man, look what we got. Because he knew a lot about hogs from Ohio. And he goes, yeah, that's really good. I said, well, Randy says, can you clean it out for us? You know. <laughs> so he told us next time, before you go, figure out how to dress the hog out. Don't, don't come back and tell me to do it, but I'll do it. And he, he did it. He did a really nice job with it. But anyway, he was just such a mild-mannered guy that, you know, everybody loved him. He couldn't, couldn't beat it. But I just want to tell you those two stories that happened then. Yeah. We will have a time of refreshments and a meal afterwards to share all those stories and more. Uh, right now, though, Janet McPherson is going to share with us two very special songs. Walter's family asked me to sing a couple of songs. The first one is one of uh, Walter's favorite hymns, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And then the second one, she, they wanted me to sing a contemporary song that we sing uh, in church that he enjoyed to uh, sing along with every Sunday. When I survey
the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. And this morning, just want to read to you Second Timothy 4, 7 through 8. Say a couple things the Lord laid on my heart as, as we close. Second Timothy 4, 7 through 8. Can't think of a better way to close our service and our remembrance of Walter. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Amen. We've heard many stories about Walter. I just have one more I want to share with you and how it applies to all of us today. Uh, about a year after I was here, so about 10 years ago, uh, on a Sunday morning I had mentioned in a story uh, how I love to eat Buckeyes. And most of you know what the Buckeyes are. The, really the Reese's cup just on steroids. You know, the round peanut butter with the chocolate made to look like a Buckeye nut. And so I mentioned it. And then the next Sunday, I didn't really have it down to mention, but I, I mentioned it again. I think I was talking about tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. I got off on sweets. I don't know. But I mentioned it again. So the next Sunday, Walter came up to me before the service, and he said, boy, you've been talking about Buckeyes a lot. And I said, ah, I love the Buckeyes. He said, have you ever seen a real Buckeye? And I went, no, I've never seen a real Buckeye. So he reached in his pocket, and he pulled out this real Buckeye, and he said, I want you to have this. It was 10 years ago. He gave me this real Buckeye. I said, that's so cool. Look at it. So that's where this, that, while they're trying to make those little sweets look like that, he said, yeah, this is the real thing. It's good. Those, are, those other things are good, but they're, they're a copy of this. I said, can you eat these? No, don't eat these. But, but this is the real thing. This is the real thing. And he gave it to me. I've kept it on my desk. I don't keep a lot of things. I'm not a thing person, but I have a few little things on my desk. Of course, I have my family picture. I have a couple little things my kids gave me. And I have this, this Buckeye. And I've kept it all this time. And, and as I was really praying about what to say at the close this morning, I, I just looked over and saw that Buckeye. And I remember Walter saying, this is the real thing. This is the real thing. Let the Lord speak to your heart about the real thing. Because Jesus is the real thing. And there's many people today who are following all sorts of things. But Jesus is the real thing. Romans 12, 2, I'm sure most of you know, says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, don't follow the world. It's trying to squeeze you into a mold that is not what Jesus wants you to be. Jesus wants you to be like him. Are you with me? He's the potter, we are the clay, not the other way around. This morning I have two challenges as we close. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. We would all love to live that long life like Walter had, 91 years, moved into that uh, nice new place, and then one, one night he goes to bed and goes to sleep, and then he wakes up the next morning in heaven, living a long, full life. Man, we all want to do that. That's, what, that's the way to do it. But we're not promised that. We're not promised that, and a lot of people don't, don't get that opportunity and that privilege. But we have today, and Jesus is coming soon, and we are all going to see him face to face one day. And these memorial services and celebrations of life are really for three purposes. The first one is to celebrate someone's life like we've been doing. The second one is to comfort the family and uh, give them 
comfort and peace and even closure. But the third one is for all of us, all of the rest of us, to pause, to take a moment and hit the pause button on our way too busy lives and to think about eternity, which we rarely think about because it's coming. It's coming for each one of us. And two challenges today, are you ready? Walter would want me to say that. He would want me to say, you better ask everybody if they're ready. Are you ready? Are you following the real Jesus? And number two, are you, if you are, are following Jesus, are you following him? Or, or are you trying to make him like you want him to be? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's too big for us to try to mold him. He wants to mold us. And it's very easy to, to take Jesus and try to make him the way we want him to be. Oh, uh, he'll be okay with this. He'll be okay with this. He'll be okay. <laughs> he is who he is. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the real thing. And we need to let him mold us to be like him. Would you bow your heads? We're going to close with a word of prayer this morning. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, and before I say a, a closing prayer, I've done so many celebration of life services, I, I honestly can't, uh, can't recount the number. But there are ones like this that are so good, that are so easy and, and celebratory because we know that we know that we know that Walter loved the Lord with all his heart, all his mind, all his soul, all his strength, and he loved people as himself. And so it's so good to do a service like this. What will your service be? Because if Jesus tarries, we're all going to have a service like this. What will your service be like? Will people say, man, that person fought the good fight and finished the race and kept the faith? Do we have the faith to keep? Because our time is coming. Let's take a few minutes that we usually never take and really think about our own eternity because we're all going to face Jesus one day. And we want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Dear Holy Father, thank you so much for this time, this celebration of a life well lived. And we ask you to say hi to Walter today. As amazing and miraculous as that is, he is with you and we know it. And Lord, we ask you to be with the family, Lord, and wrap your arms around them. Give them the peace that passes all understanding. Comfort them like only you can because he leaves a void. And Lord, for all of us, help us, Lord, today to stop, to pause. And to think about our eternity, Lord. You give us such a great deal. You say, give me your life. If it's 91 years, it's 91 years. If it's 100, it's 100. If it's 50, it's 50. Give me your life, and I'm going to give you eternity with me. It's the best deal around. May we take it. May we take you up on it. And may we live for you. Go with us now in peace. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. Amen. 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 I want to thank you for coming. As I said earlier, there's a meal for everybody. It, I think this is the first time we've ever said, it's a meal for everybody. We usually have a meal for the family, but the family wanted all of you to enjoy some time together and some food together and fellowship. So I'm going to ask you to stand. And say a closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time. We ask that you bless this meal, bless this fellowship, Lord. And may we praise you each and every day as we live in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you so much.